Thank you, Miss Marilyn, and thank you earlier, Zilla, for singing, <clears throat> and Jason for being the bravest one in the building today. <clears throat> Next week they're switching. Jason's singing the solo, and Zilla's going to do the children's sermon. That's a, another executive decision I'm making. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, Last week I preached a sermon on the greatest need. Um, we talked about what our greatest need was as, as people, period, as even those who don't know Christ Jesus, but those of us who do know Christ Jesus. And we began with a quote uh, by one of my pastor preacher heroes, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And his quote was this. He said, our supreme need, our only need, is to know God, the living God. We talked about this supreme need, this greatest need from the book of Philippians chapter 3. And we talked about how we can, in fact, know the living God and that our, we can know him more and more and more and that the desire to know him more comes from the love that he planted within us. The scripture tells us that we love because God first loved us and that it's our desire or our love for God that, that makes us want to know Christ more. And as we know him more, that it will absolutely affect the way that we act. It will affect the things that we do. As Jason talked about this morning with our children, as we're made new, we will speak differently, act differently, give differently, and go differently. Um, and so we talked about knowing God. Um, my intention was not to have what looks like a two-part sermon series, um, but that's what God had planned. Um, and so last week, as we talked about our greatest need, uh, today we're going to be talking about our greatest news, uh, or the greatest news. Again, I want to open up with a quote by someone that I really, really look up to. Uh, there's a pastor in New York City at a church named Redeemer Church. His name is Dr. Tim Keller. He's got this incredible quote. Um, that I've heard many, many times, and I don't know that ever fails uh, to just wreck me when I read it. It says this, Dr. Tim Keller said, To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. So to be fully known and fully loved is to be loved by God. And this is our greatest news, is that we are fully known and we are also, in fact, fully loved. And so we're going to take a look at this greatest news today, turning into a very popular scripture. So go to the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 53. Um, a lot of us have spent a lot of time in Isaiah 53. We could spend forever in Isaiah 53. But today, we're going to look at the greatest news of being fully known and fully loved in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6. So when you turn there we'll read it aloud and then we'll pray and ask God to read to bless the reading of his word. Isaiah 53 verse 6. It says this, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that your word speaks to us, at us, about us, for your glory. I thank you that it declares your story of redemption from the beginning, the fall at the beginning, when Adam and Eve chose to rebel and run from you, and we have followed suit. It's always been about you redeeming your people for your glory. So God, I pray this morning that you would open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things from your scripture because you told us to pray that. God, would you take your word, would you pierce my heart, would you pierce our hearts this morning, Father, so that we can be more like your son. Glorify yourself here, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's not often that I read something throughout the week that kind of lines up so perfectly with the scripture, specifically not a story or something else like that, but I came across something a few days ago that I wanted to share with you. It has some names that you're familiar with uh, about Sherlock Holmes. Um, it's a story from a little snippet about Sherlock Holmes, and it says this, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John Watson went on a camping trip. After a great dinner, they gathered around the fire, and after great conversation, they decided to retire to their tent. At 3 a.m., Holmes wakes up, and he nudges Watson, and he said, Watson, Look into the sky and tell me what you see. Watson says, I see millions of stars, Holmes. And Holmes says, what does that tell you? Watson replies this way. Astronomically, it tells me there's millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is a part of the constellation Leo. Theologically, it tells me that God is great and we are small and insignificant. Orologically, it tells me it's about 3 a.m. 
<laughs> Meteorologically, it tells me that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. But you, Holmes, what does it say to you? And Sherlock Holmes replied, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> Sometimes we miss the most, you'll get that later. <laughs> Sometimes we miss the most obvious of things. I mean, they're just right there in our face and we miss them. Sometimes we miss that someone is actually talking to us and about us rather than all those people scattered across the globe. The scripture we're in today, Isaiah 53, 6, is about us. Each of us. It speaks to all of us. Yes, collectively as a group, but as individuals as well. We cannot escape that. So this morning, let's start with the very first two words in this passage of we all. We all. From the very beginning, this makes me nervous and it should make you uncomfortable too because we hate being lumped together with other people. We don't like the idea of being put together in a group. This morning I used your two brothers in the example and I said that when we talk about the McMullen kids, they don't want to be known as the McMullen kids. They want to have individuality. They want to be themselves. They want to be, they want to be I want to be TJ, I want to be Daniel, I want to be Liana. I want to be myself. I don't want to just be the McMullen kids. And, and so we mentioned that this morning. But also, go back to your school days where you think about. Now, I don't know what your schooling was like. I got a lot of weird looks this morning when I said it this way, specifically from the teacher. But what my schooling looked like is oftentimes a teacher would come into the room and they would say things like this. You're not doing your best. You're not trying. No one's working hard. No one's paying attention. No one's doing their work. When you're tracing your G's on the little dotted lines, you're not focusing in and not doing your stuff. But maybe, just maybe, you were that kid that was trying. You were doing your best. You were going out of your way to work your hardest to accomplish the cursive language or cursive handwriting. And you were doing your best to learn your lesson. And you hated being lumped into those bad apples that weren't doing their work. You can even go to your job and think about it, regardless of what you do. You do your best. You give your all so that your company will reach its highest level of success. As a matter of fact, you're doing so well that if they just looked at you as an individual, they would see the money that the company is gaining from you. You are making money for your company. Your company is reaching far beyond their goals because you're doing your best. You're working so incredibly hard. But is that what our bosses normally look at? No. They look at the collective picture because that's their job. And they may gather us up into a group and they say, guys, we're not doing a good job. We're not doing well. We're losing money. Things are bad. We're not working hard enough. We're not going out of our way. And you're all going to suffer for it. There's going to be cutbacks to all of you. You're going to lose your benefits. Your paychecks are going to go down. Some of you are going to lose your job. All of you are going to lose your job because none of you are trying. We hate being lumped in, but that's exactly what's going on here. The word here, we all, is a collective word. It literally means every single person that's ever walked on this planet. Those now, those before, and those that will come until Jesus says it's done. Every person in the line of Adam, this is talking to. This is all encompassing. You and I can't escape this. We do our best to wiggle out of things like this, to try our best to get out of these situations and these scenarios, but we cannot do it. It also speaks to something else that hurts us and hurt to hear these things is we're not as unique as we think. The Bible says that every single one of us was created in the image of a perfect father. Every one of us. And we know that God did something special with every one of us making our thumb or our fingerprints different from every other person on the planet. That there is a level of individuality that all of us hold. But in this scenario, we're not unique. God is speaking to all of us. He's speaking to Brock. He's speaking to you. And I mean that you with the singular term. To every single one of us, he speaks to us. We all like sheep. <coughs> I did it this morning. Some of you were here in that service, and so I'll do it again. Has anyone in this room ever spent time studying sheep or a whole lot of time about sheep? Good. I can get away with it one more time. I did this morning, although I was pulled to the side this morning and told an incredible story of someone who knew way more about sheep than I did. <laughs> Years ago, I was teaching at a youth camp um, with some students that I was leading at that time, and we were talking about Jesus being the great shepherd. And so as I looked into Jesus being the great shepherd, I started to realize something that is true about when Jesus was walking the earth and teaching and in the New Testament, but also the Old Testament as well, is that 
a lot of times the Bible speaks about us, God's people, as sheep. And so it kind of surprised me. I'm thinking of all the animals you could use. You could use the butterfly. You could use anything. But God chose to use sheep. And that was intentional. And there was a purpose. And so I started to look at things about sheep. Studying about the habits of sheep or shepherds and different things. It was quite interesting and kind of sad for me and will be for you in just a moment. And funny. We think about Psalm 23, which is a very famous passage that talks a lot about the great shepherd and the father God. And also us, the sheep. And it says things like he'll take his rod and his staff. He'll comfort us and he'll guide us. He'll make us lie down in green pastures. He'll lead us to still waters. He'll anoint our heads with oil. Showing all these things that God the shepherd does for his children, the sheep. And so I'm walking through this thing and the one thing that I come to realize pretty quick is this. Sheep are really, really dumb. <laughs> I mean really dumb. Detrimental to themselves in fact. The reason that God needs to guide and protect us is this. You think of a shepherd's staff and so the picture we have in our minds is it's really tall, taller than the shepherd so it has reach but it has a curve on the end. Sometimes they don't have a curve but they have a knot, a hard on one, a hard part on one end so that it can, it can hit away an enemy. So like if a bear comes or a wolf comes, it can attack that animal and beat that animal away to protect the sheep. On the other end, it actually has a sharp point to prod the sheep in the right direction, to guide them. And that's because sheep are dumb. Because sheep will literally walk on a trail, and if you pretend that the edge of the stage is a cliff, now the trail could turn to the right or to the left, and the sheep will just walk right off the edge of the mountain to their death. Foolishness. And I don't mean in the night time when things are hard to see. I mean noon in the daytime when it's very clear that you have a turning, the turn of the trail to this side or a turn of the trail to this side and that over that is rocks, cliff, and doom. And the sheep will just march right off. And so the shepherd has to come in and poke and prod and guide the sheep in the right direction. It says the shepherd has to put oil or anoint oil on the head of the sheep. It's because the sheep can't even deal with the, ins or the small little pestering, bothersome things in its life. If you think about when gnats or mosquitoes or flies start to, even one pushes us near the limits of that we have. And you look at sheep or animals and they have hundreds if not thousands of gnats and flies and bugs in their nostrils and in their ears and around their eyes and they're swatting and they're doing all sorts of things but they don't have hands where they can reach up and hit and so when they're being driven literally to the point that they can handle they start to harm themselves and butt their heads on trees and each other and rub their hands violently in the ground to where they're damaging themselves and harming themselves and so it takes a shepherd to step in and anoint them and, or literally put oil on them to keep the pest away. We can't do anything to protect ourselves from the bear, from the wolf, or even the smallest of bothersome things. It takes the shepherd to lead the sheep to grass, to green grass, where we can lie down but also eat. Because sheep are known to eat things that are dangerous for it. They'll eat things that, that are, have no nutrition, but also things that are poisonous. It'll dine on these things, and even after it makes a sheep sick, the sheep will just dine right again on the same exact thing. Sounds a lot like us. Things that hurt us or things that harm us. And we just go right back to it. And then the last one, probably my most hated and favorite one about sheep is this. Water. You'll guide me to still waters. Now we know about sheep. We know that they grow wool. We know that sometimes they look way too overgrown. And actually a dirty sheep may be the grossest looking thing on the planet. But they grow wool and it grows all the way up their heads and all the way over their face. And it's the shepherd's job to trim back that wool on the face and to pay attention while the sheep drinks. And here's why. Because as a sheep does something as simple as getting a drink of water. It kneels its head into the water to take a drink. And as it does, that water begins to soak up into the wool around its face. And you've seen this happen. You can't just put a, a cotton ball in a little bit of water. If you leave it there, the whole cotton ball is saturated quickly. Same thing with the sheep. The, the water starts to shap, saturate the whole sheep's head to where eventually it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And eventually just a small drink of water will drown the sheep and take its life out. And so the shepherd has to watch over and protect and watch the sheep even doing that. It takes a shepherd because sheep need food, protection, guidance, cleaning. And we are sheep. We're sheep. We're detrimental to ourselves. We're harmful. We can't lead ourselves. We can't guide ourselves. We all like sheep. And the next one is have gone astray. This tells us a lot here. 
lays out a lot of things that are very, very clear. And the first one is this. If we can go astray, that must mean that there is a right direction. That must mean that there is a standard, that there is one right way. That there is an absolute truth, an absolute right direction. And that's God's standard. And God's standard, God's direction is perfection. He gave the law and said, this is the perfect way for you to walk. Now be holy as I am holy. God's standard is that every single one of us would follow the law to perfection and do things exactly right, never falling off, never straying away, never sinning. That's God's standard, is perfection. Now we can't do that. I can't do that. You can't do that. We have not done that. We've all gone astray. Every one of us. But the world tells us differently. The world says there is no absolute truth. There's no absolute standard. There's no, there's no run one right way. It's okay if you guys are Christians. But we may do it a different way. I do it by being a good guy or doing these other things. Listen to these philosophical statements that the world says. That quite frankly sometimes we just accept as just, that sounds really smart like truth. It says things like this when speaking about all religions. All roads lead to Rome. I want you to break that down real slow. That's really a stupid statement. Because all roads, in fact, do not lead to Rome. <laughs> they all lead in different directions and in different places. And so to think about the fact that we would say that you can be a faithful Muslim, or a faithful Hindu, or a faithful Buddhist, or a faithful atheist, or a faithful whatever, and a faithful Christian as well, and that all roads lead to the same place, is dumb. It's dumb. It's foolish and it's wrong. The world also says stuff like this when we say stuff that there is an absolute truth, an absolute right way. There's one way to get to eternity in paradise with God and that is through Christ Jesus. They call us bigots and call us all kinds of names for saying that. But when we make those statements, the world likes to tell us there is no absolute truth. And they do it with this moral superiority, this big high. There's no absolute truth. And I gave away a secret in the first service and I will hear it too. I love it when people say that to me. That there is no absolute truth. Because my response is always the same. Is that absolutely true? <laughs> because what they're telling you is that there's no absolute truth by stating an absolute truth. And so they want to go in this circular reasoning or this circular argument. But the fact is, my friends, is that there is an absolute truth. And we've all missed it. We've all missed it. And I don't just mean missing it. It's much worse than that. As a matter of fact, this, pass, this little part of this passage is literally the definition of sin. It's the definition of sin. The word that we use to get the word sin, that we translate in English to sin, is an archer's word, an archery word. Now, I gave a shameless plug in the first service. I'll do it again here. I'm a bow hunter. I love to bow hunt, so looking for some places to bow hunt. And so, and so I shoot my bow a lot. Last night, one of my sons was practicing his bow and arrow. And as you look at it, you don't have to be an archer to understand this, but as you look at a target, right in the very center, usually red, is what? The bullseye. And when we're aiming for the bullseye, where in the bullseye are we aiming? Dead center. Where's the right spot to hit on a target? Dead center of the bullseye. Dead center. Every time. And so the right way to be the right kind and a good archer is every single time hitting dead center bullseye. Nah, I'm not saying I hit dead center bullseye every single time. But that is the right way to do it. And so when I say that this is the perfect image of sin, I don't mean that we've looked at the bullseye and we say, okay, there is one right standard, there's one perfect direction, and it's dead center of that bullseye, and we shoot, and maybe we miss a little bit, and we hit the edge of bullseye. We're like, ah, it's pretty good. It's still bullseye. Or maybe we go out to the next ring, which is usually white, and we're like, oh, that's all right. I'll take that. That's close to bullseye. I'm doing okay. You know, life's going all right. Or then maybe we venture into the yellow or the red, or maybe you're one of those people that just hits the edge of your target, and you're like, ah, it does for today. 
That's not what this is talking about when it says that we've missed it, that we've all gone astray. It literally means this, that there is one right standard. There is one perfect way. There's God's perfect way that Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. There's one spot, one perfect middle spot in the bullseye, and that we know that, we look at that, we see that, and then we turn and we shoot the other direction on purpose. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Every one of us. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned toward our own way. We think we know what's best for ourselves. We think we know how to guide ourselves and to lead ourselves. But we're sheep. We're sheep. Not only are we sheep, but this is so arrogant and foolish. And to be honest, this is the core root of idolatry. We think about that God is the one that literally formed everything from nothing with his words. That God is the one that decided that the earth should be tilted just a certain degree on its axis. It says that with his word, God keeps everything in its place. He keeps the earth in the sky and keeps the earth spinning at the right speed. And he is the one that came up with the idea of gravity. God created this symbiotic relationship to where what plants need, we don't need. So we exhale it. And what plants don't need, they let out oxygen. And that's what we need. The symbiotic relationship. God created all these things. God created the intricacies of our body and how we take in oxygen and our lungs inflate and deflate. And all these things that we had nothing to do with. God created all those things. And then we say, I'll take it from here. I'll lead myself. I guide myself. I know what's best for me. I know where I belong. I know what I need to do. I know what my dreams are for today and for my life. God, you just be quiet on your throne over there for just a moment. I've got this, God. I'll do me for a little while. That is idolatry. I'll play God for a moment. That is idolatry, and we are all guilty of it. In the book of Judges, one of the it's, it's frequently repeated through the book of Judges over and over. It says that every man did what was right in his own eyes. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Meaning that if I do what's right in my own eyes, my family's starving because we have no food in our pantry, but we know that you do. We just come over and kill you and take your food because that's right in my eyes. And that's what's good for me. I'm not concerned about you. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And these are the things that we see going on in that day. Sexual sin was rampant. Adultery, all over the place. Pornography, all over the place. No, it, I know that. It wasn't on the computer, but they had it. Sexual sin, all over. The, their, their culture was identified by sexual sin. Murder, abundant. Greed, abundant. Robbery, abundant. Violence, killing, death. All these things, abundant. And this one. The murdering and sacrifice of babies by the tens of millions. Murdering babies in the womb before they took their first breath or saw the first light of day. Taking babies that had been born and literally sacrificing them to the false gods and deities of their age. Now this is gross. But I need to say it because I need us to see how serious this stuff gets. Taking babies and not only sacrificing them to false gods, but eating them. Grotesque and nasty in an age when every man did what was right in his own eyes. How's our day going? How would you define our day? The same. The same. The same. Violence. Greed, murder, robbery, corruption, sexual sin, and murdering babies by the millions. Tossing them up to the false gods of our day, career, dreams, hopes. Let the party continue. I don't want to stop yet. Nothing has changed. Every man doing what's right in his own eyes because we think we know best. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. How are you guys feeling at this point? Me too. Grateful. Yeah. Grateful that God loves us. Grateful. Or prayful, prayerful too. As I walked through this, and this was the message that God began to churn inside me and say, Brock, this is what I want you to proclaim. Not only did I have to realize what he was saying, I had to realize that he was talking to me too. 
And I didn't feel very good about myself at this point. But here's what I realized, and if you're honest with yourself, you are known. You're known. God knows everything about you. He knows your choices. He knows all things about you and that God knows me. Think of all the times that you've decided to guide yourself. Or all the times that you've tried to fix things yourself or do things yourself or go about it your own way. Didn't normally turn out very well. Or maybe it's on its path to leading badly right now. Think of how many times we've chosen to follow the foolish counsel in our heart. Or even share it with other people. The counsel being this, follow your heart. And we say it all the time. That's what we tell our kids when they begin to be in relationships. It's what our parents maybe told us. When we're making decisions about careers or moving or other things, we say things like, follow your heart. Let me tell you what Jeremiah the prophet said in chapter 17, verse 9 of Jer the book of Jeremiah. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and wicked. Who can know it? Follow your heart. That thing that you can't understand. Follow your heart. That thing that will lie to you. It's wicked above all other things. Don't follow your heart. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. We're just sheep kicking against the goads, thinking we know best. But the truth is, is that we are known. God knows us to the core of us. Let me share that quote with you again. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. The greatest news we have is that we are fully known and fully loved. Let me share two verses with you. Jesus said and recorded in John chapter 15 verse 13, Greater love has no man than this, than he laid on his life for his friends. You are loved. Romans chapter 5 verse 8, But God demonstrates his love for us in this way. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While God knew us as rebellious, sheep-like sinners who go our own way and are going to choose to go our own way, even then he loved us. While he fully knew us as sinners, he fully loved us in that he demonstrated it by sending his son to die for us. Let's keep going. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned towards his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. First thing this points out, this was the Lord's doing. This was the Lord's doing. Jesus on the cross was the Lord's doing. Now I know, theologically, Jesus was on the cross because of my sins, your sins, and the sins of humanity. But the God of heaven could have chosen any way. Any other system, any other method, and he chose to lay the iniquity on his son and to hang his son on a cross. The cross was God's doing. That is crucial for us to understand that. Crucial. Crucial because we can never take credit for it. It was God's doing. The second thing it points out is that Jesus died for our sins. He didn't just pass out or swoon. Jesus was not just beaten for my iniquities or beaten for my sins. Jesus was not just bruised or broken for your sins or your wrongdoings or your iniquities. Jesus was not just hurt or embarrassed as he hung naked in front of his friends on a cross and in front of his mother. That, that's not all that happened for our sins. The Bible says this, that the wages of sin is death. The wages, the cost of my sin is death. The wages and the cost of your sin is death. And God laid on him the wages, the iniquity of us all. Jesus died for our sin. He died for our sins. Next, Jesus bears much so we don't have to. Jesus said, come to me all of you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. We cannot bear our sin. Here's what bearing your sin looks like. Hell. Sin is literally those who've looked at Jesus, looked at God, or never heard the truth and said, I'll bear it myself. I'll wear my own iniquities. I'll wear my own punishment. I'll keep my wages that I've earned. And for all eternity, they burn but not burn up. They're crushed but not crushed into oblivion. They're twisted but not destroyed to where they disappear. All eternity, wearing this weight of something they cannot bear. That's what bearing that is, and they can't do it. But the truth is, is, you don't have to. Not only did Jesus welcome all those who are weary and heavy laden, he says, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is light. 
A yoke literally being the thing that they used to put animals in that guided their animals, that hoisted the power up and guided the power as they dug the trenches in their fields for farm work. And Jesus says, look how heavy yours is. With all of that sin you're bearing, carry mine, it's light. But somebody has to carry yours. And somebody has to carry mine because there's wages for our sinful work. Jesus carries much, so we don't have to. And then lastly, Jesus is stronger than we can possibly imagine. I said I wasn't going to say this in the service because there'll be a confirmation here. I love cheesy Christian movies. I always have. I don't know why. There's no reason for it. I don't mean those good ones. Like there, there's some really good Christian movies, and there, there's some like really, really bad ones, like the cheesy ones. I love those. I, they've just always been appealing to me. But I'll tell you one thing that I hate about them. I hate the caricature that we see of Jesus in movies. I hate how they twist Jesus to make him look like something different. They make him look so weak. And I don't mean when he's on the cross or being beaten. I just mean his personality as he walks through day-to-day -day ministry or life with the apostles. He looks so weak. They make him look effeminate or even neutral sometimes. Where you can't tell, is he really a man? Is he really a woman? We, we don't really know. They make him look like a... I mean, they... they put him up to be like some hippie to where he's just walking around barefoot hey amen light of the world follow me now I'm not going to spend time up here saying I know Jesus must have been masculine he worked with his hands carpenter must have been a man's man I don't know that and I don't need to know that to know that Jesus was so incredibly strong because Jesus here's what I know about Jesus is he knew the burden. He knew what my sin would cost. He knew what your sin would cost. He knew that the full wrath of God, the full cup of the wrath, was what was required of him. He knew that all of God's wrath was going to rest on his shoulders. So much so that he said, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, let your will be done. And God said, this is my will. That you would bathe in the full cup of all of my wrath for all of their sins. And Jesus said, let it be so. And he took it. He took it. He bore it. It says, like a lamb led to the slaughter, he kept his mouth silent. He didn't say anything. Incredible strength. And we meet these people, or to be honest, maybe you are these people. And you say things like this, yeah, yeah, Jesus may work for you, but not me. You don't know my past. You don't know my history. You don't know what I did when I was in college. You don't know what I said when I was in high school. You don't know the things that I, the, the things that I think. You don't know the words that I use. You don't know how I treated my children or the decisions that I've made. You don't know me. Jesus, maybe he can forgive you, but he can't forgive me. Arrogance. You mean to tell me that Jesus can bear the sins of the entire world, but not yours? Pride idolatry, arrogance. Jesus can bear your sins and desires to bear your sins. The gospel truly is the greatest news of all time. This is the greatest news we've ever heard. The fact that Jesus looked into a broken, rebellious world. A world that he had created perfect and said, you've all rebelled against me. You've all gone your own way thinking that you were boss. You all want to play God and you want to choose your own way. And it's caused you doom, destruction, where you wander off the edge of a cliff. where You can't protect yourselves and you're dead, dying, wounded. And everything's happening to you. It's so bad. And to think that God should have just gone, I'm done with you. And he didn't. Instead he says, I love you. In the middle of all that mess. I know you. I know what you've done and what you're going to do. And I love you so much that I'm going to send my perfect son to sacrifice him on a thief's cross. And to one day raise him from the grave so that you can have eternal life and forgiveness of sins. What other kind of love is there than that? What a love story. Have you ever wondered how God felt in the middle of this? I mean, how did he feel as Jesus bore that burden? I think back to actually a good Christian film, a painful Christian film of The Passion of the Christ. And if you can recall, and if you maybe you haven't seen it or you can't recall, but at the very end, as Jesus is on the cross and he's died and he's, he, he, he's dead at this point on the cross, it, it zooms up into this, in this crazy camera angle and it looks like it's a teardrop forming in someone's eye. 
And then this teardrop gets to the point and it falls down to the earth and crushes as this gigantic look like a raindrop, insinuating that God is sad. That God is upset about this. And we think, was God sad? Was he upset? Was he confused? Was he angry? Was he afraid? What emotion was God feeling here? And the Bible answers that for us here. You want to talk about love? Look at Isaiah 53.10. It says, it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. The old King James goes so much further. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. You want to talk about love? That God knew how, would we re how we would react, how we would be. He knew us so well. And it pleased him to crush the son for our sins. That's love. You and I are loved. Fully known and fully loved. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is the love of God. You are fully known. You are fully loved. This is our greatest news. This morning, I may not know you, but you are known. You are known by the one who created you and holds you together. You are known by the one who holds the oxygen in the air and is currently making your lungs work. You are known by the one who squeezes your heart and keeps it going. Maybe no one else in your family understands you. Maybe no one else on earth gets you. But the God of heaven gets you. He knows you to your core. All of your messes. All of your mistakes. All of your nastiness. And he loves you in the middle of it. In a few minutes, we're going to sing hymn number 712. Sent forth by God's blessing. And we're going to do something from time to time. And today is one of those times. We're going to have an opportunity, an invitation, if you will. I'm going to stand down here and I'm just going to wait and I'm going to be praying. And I'm going to invite you to something this morning. Maybe you've never heard this good news, the gospel message that God knows you as a wicked, corrupt sinner and loves you and chooses to forgive you through the sacrificial death, blood, and resurrection of His Son. Maybe you've never heard that. You have now. Now you're accountable for that news. Maybe you've heard it a million times and never accepted that. Now, there's nothing magical about me in that spot. But I'm going to ask you, if today is the day of salvation for you, and you want to come and accept the greatest gift, or maybe you've got questions about that, or you just want to pray, I'm going to be right there. Maybe today you've let this great news, this greatest of news, be lesser news in your life. For us believers, and there needs to be a moment of repentance. Now, you can repent in your pew. You can repent where you are and pray and ask the Father to forgive you. I would even lead you to read through 1 John while you sit there. Rather than singing, Marilyn won't get mad. Read through 1 John and repent and deal with those things. But maybe you need to pray. I'll be there with, to pray with you. Maybe there's someone in the room you need to get right with. Go and pray with him. Go do that. <coughs> or maybe just this. Maybe you've been looking for a while. I wish I could find that church. Maybe you've been visiting here for a week or years or decades. I've only been here for three weeks. I was sick one of those. But here's what I've learned about Ledgewood. It's not perfect. They've got flaws. They bicker and they argue just like normal people because they are in fact normal people. But here's what else I've learned about them. They really desire to honor the Father who loves them and knows them. And so as their pastor this morning, I would like to offer an invitation to you. Now I'm not a member yet myself. I don't even know how that goes down. <laughs> but I'm going to offer for you to come up here and to say, hey, I'd like to join this body of unperfect people celebrating a perfect God. And I'll take your information and the next week I'll call you and we'll learn together how to become members of this place. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you after we pray to stand. We're going to sing hymn 712. And I'll be here at the front. If you've got business to do with the Lord, do it. If that pertains in your pew or with me. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I said it once earlier, but God, I'm going to say it again because it just seems right to say it. I don't like the fact that I'm known. It scares me to death. I want to be able to put on a mask and pretend. And I can do this with every living person on this planet, but you, you know me. You know my fears and my failures. You know my pride. 
Look at how I hoist it up, and I love to feel good about myself. God, you know all, everything about me that I've ever done, thought, or will do. You know me fully, and you love me fully. And that's the same for my friends in this room. God, whether they're in a relationship with Christ Jesus or separated from Him because they are not, you know them fully and love them fully. And you've already demonstrated your love in that you sent your Son to die for us. So, Father, as we stand to sing this song, sent forth by loving God, I pray that you would help us be deaf to all those around us. Help us not see them. Help us just to sing praises to the God who is worthy and then do business with us and help us to obey with boldness. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.